Well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this second Song Connections event on Hafiz and Persian poetry in song. We're coming to you live from the Jacqueline Dupre Music Building here at St Hilda's College in the University of Oxford. Our conversation will be interspersed with specially pre-recorded song examples. My name is Philip Bullock. I'm Professor of Russian Literature and Music here at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of Wadham College. And I'm delighted to be joined by two experts. Here, sitting on my left, is Susan Lolova, who is a British-Iranian composer and researcher whose work explores Iranian identity through the lens of music. She's completing a PhD at City University of London and has studied Iranian classical music at Carnegie Mellon University in the US. She currently lectures in composition at Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, and her work as a composer has been performed across the world. There'll be a chance to hear one of her works, Mach die Dame, performed by the Hermes Ensemble at Tuesday's late night concert. I'm also joined by Edmund Herzig, Masume and Feredun Sudavar Professor of Persian Studies at the University of Oxford, and also a fellow of Wadham College. His research interests range widely across the pre-modern, early modern, and right to the contemporary periods, and range equally widely across Iran, the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Afghanistan. After our discussion, there'll be a live Q&A, so please do email your questions to songconnections at oxfordleader.co.uk or via Twitter with the hashtag OLF2020. Before our conversation, we should probably hear some music. So first we have Sally Beamish's Nightingale, the first of her four songs from Hafez, performed by Roderick Williams and Andrew Weiss. Oh. 
We've just heard a piece there by a contemporary British composer setting words by Hafez. And now I'd like to think a little bit about where that encounter began between Britain and Persian literature. So, Ed, perhaps you could uh, sketch that for us. It, it goes back a long way. So, in fact, Persian poetry was known in England. Uh, British libraries were buying copies of Persian poetry. The Bodleian had quite a good collection already by the end of the 17th century. But the decisive moment for the appreciation of Persian poetry uh, in, in Britain uh, comes really at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century, and it, it comes hand in hand with the British becoming a power in India and not going there just to trade, but beginning to be uh, administrators and governors there. And you know, while we now often think very ambivalently or negatively about the history of empire and its impacts on, uh, on, the, on the people at the receiving end of empire, it has to be said that, that for the appreciation of Persian poetry in England uh, and for some of the people who went out as administrators but were very much scholar administrators and connoisseur administrators, it was a fantastic time. And some of these people, educated by the Indian clerks and their Indian interlocutors, became you know, real connoisseurs of not just poetry, poetry, art. They learned Persian to a very high level and then some of them you know, brought it home. So that's really where, where it, it comes from in a, in a decisive way. And there's one person in particular who I think uh, we should s spend a moment on, and that's somebody called Sir William Jones. And today, you know, in, in the academic world, he's remembered mainly as somebody who was one of the founding fathers of comparative linguistics and Indo-Iranian philology, uh, the discoverer of the connection between ancient Greek and Sanskrit. Much less well remembered today is his role in um, encouraging in the English-speaking world to notice Persian poetry. Uh, he wrote a Persian grammar in, published in 1771, which had a, a couplet of Hafez on the frontispiece. And then a year later, later, he wrote a collection of Oriental poetry, a lot of it Persian, but also some from Arabic, some from Turkish, uh, which became a, a, a really popular work. And he and one other, one or two others were really the people who introduced the English-speaking public to Persian poetry through translation. Um, and you know, from there, it began to influence English poets. Uh, Jones translated, one of Jones's translations of a, of a famous Hafez uh, lyric called generally the Shirazi Turk, uh, he called uh, a Persian song. And that became enormously popular and very, very well known. And you know, 19th century English literature is littered with references to this and, and, the, and the maid of Shiraz. We, you know, he, he calls her, he calls the, the person to whom the poet is addressed, the poem is addressed a, a, a maid. And so we know that that particular translation was very influential. And, and that remains to this day by far the most sort of translated and imitated of Hafiz's poems in the English speaking world. Byron did a parody of, uh, 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 of Jones's translation. So Jones begins the first, his first line is, sweet maid, if thou wouldst charm my sight. And in Byron's parody, that comes out as barmaid, if for this shilling white. And it <laughs> continues in that style. Brilliant, but, but, rather, but mocking. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Ed. I think some of your key words there were translation and literature, but then the translation is called a Persian song. So, Susan, could you tell us a little bit about actually how Hafiz and this poetry was operating in Iran itself? Because is it, is it quite fair to call it literature as such? Yeah, well, there's a very interesting and very um, kind of dense connection between um, this poetry and music. Um, and really, um, you know, in, in Farsi, even today, the verb that you use, khundan, um, you, that's a verb that you can use to mean to read a poem to yourself, to recite a poem out loud, or to sing um, lyrics. So there's a linguistic slippage between all those things. Um, and a lot of um, Hafez's work is, is really songs. I mean, like the Ghazal are really kind of love songs. Um, and so we see this very, very intimate connection between Iranian classical music um, and um, the work of poets like Hafez and, and, other, and other medieval poets. Um, you know, and that um, 
the effect of that is that you know a lot of the rhythmic material from um, in Iranian classical music it comes from the rhythms of poetry um, and you know we this is important still today you know in the tw uh, 20th century we have um, a very important Iranian musician called Nur Ali Borumand who I think the famous quote is he says that um, a verse without a melody is like a, is like a bride without jewels. They're absolutely connected. Well, I think this will be a really good moment to hear a jewel this time of the musical repertoire. This is another song by Sally Beamish from that same set of four songs from Hafiz. This is the third song, Fish. We just heard there about this British encounter with Persian poetry mediated through empire and the late 18th, early 19th century. But I'm thinking of the Leader Festival audience, who, if they know Hafez, and I'm sure they do, probably know him through German translations mm. and uh, know him through the songs, perhaps, of Schubert and Schumann and the figure of, of Goethe above all. Um, so, so what's the bigger picture here? How is the British uh, encounter uh, uh, reacting to or following on from developments elsewhere in, in Europe in this period, or perhaps even earlier? Mm. Well, I mean, in, in France and in Germany, you see a, a similar interest in Oriental poetry and Persian poetry. Roughly the same time, of course, you know, the, the experiences of, of empire are, are different. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, you get the same movement from a sort of more scholarly, uh, more niche interest to a, a broader one, especially as people start to translate, uh, you know, in large amounts of, of, of poetry into French, into German, in, into other European languages. It begins to find its way, you know, into a wider public, and then it begins to influence writers. I think it has to be said that Goethe really stands head and shoulders above everybody else when it comes to Hafez. Uh, 
you know, there's no English equivalent of that. Um, uh, so, you know, w w one should recognize that, 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 he, that, that there is a very particular relationship between uh, German, German literature uh, and Hafez, and then how that finds its way into song, which isn't really matched in any other European tradition. Yeah. And I think there's a, a, a French phrase as well, which is tied up, isn't it, with mm. questions of religious tolerance and um, diversity and uh, the Shiraz as a city figuring as a place uh, where people can coexist and so that appropriation of a key moment of, of, of Iranian history in the service of, of Europe after the wars of religion and those kind of... Um, yes, that, that, that's right. I mean, I, I think in each of the European traditions, you know, as often happens, when, when there is a, a wish to turn a page in your own culture or to challenge a canon that, you know, young poets or feel that is getting stale or stayed, one of the ways that you can do that is to draw on, uh, you know, an, an external cultural tradition. And you, you, you make of it what you need to for, for your own purposes. So, you know, that's, it's not the case necessarily that all of the, you know, the English romantics who were, who were interested in oriental, in oriental poetry didn't appreciate it in all its depth and complexity necess necessarily. They didn't appreciate it as an Iranian might have appreciated that poetry. But they did find in some, something in it that was fine and uh, exciting and fresh and you know aesthetically pleasing yeah. that they could then mobilize in their own tradition and, and the same is really true as you have mentioned in France and, and in Germany. And I think also a city like Vienna plays a very special role doesn't it because the, the uh, way in which the Austrian Empire interacts with the Ottoman Empire gives it the same sort of linguistic questions about uh, imperial administrators or not uh, imperial administrators in this question but people who are traveling trading learning a variety of oriental languages and along with that comes cultural appreciation and, and often uh, a profound love for the culture that they're sent out to, to sort of control and to, to manage. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think it's, you know, we, we're so used to thinking of British India through the lens of the sort of late Raj, you know, and when it's very, very structured, there's a very clear hierarchy, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of hierarchy of race. Um, uh, but especially in the early 19th century, the, you know, the, the British are by no means the only game in town, uh, and they're by no means uh, always in a, in a position of superior, superiority. Uh, and you know, while lots of Englishmen went out just to get rich quick, and they, had, you know, they really did not have cultural interactions, and if you look at the pages of English literature of the early 19th century, you know, there's lots of these nabobs who've gone out, made a quick buck, and are coming back to just sort of marry into the aristocracy. There are not a small number of people who really did develop an appreciation of the, of the culture uh, that, they, that they went to. And the same, as you say, is, is true also in continental Europe in, in each of those language cultures. Well, we should probably hear one of those language cultures now. This is a setting by Anton Rubinstein, Die Helle Sonne Leuchtet. It's not actually Hafez, and it's not actually Persian poetry, um, although it was published as one of his 12 Persian poems in 1851. It, in fact, takes words by Mirza Shafi Vaze, in originally in Azeri, but then translated very freely into German by Friedrich Bodenstedt. <laughs> 
So it's clear that uh, Hafez Persian poetry, Oriental poetry more generally, is appealing. Why is it so appealing? Uh, what is it about the, the words, the themes, that means that generations of writers thereafter, even if they've not learned a word of the language, and they're not the kind of William Joneses of this world, what is it that they get out of that? And that, I guess, is a question to both of you. Yeah. I, I think it goes back, actually, to something that Suzanne said uh, earlier. It, the, this poetry, you know, the poetry that Hafiz is famous for, and, and much of the poetry that w became very popular in the West, is Ghazal poetry, lyric poetry, and it's love poetry. And although the repertoire of images and symbolism is culturally distinct, the, the fact that it's the, these are relatively short love poems uh, in the main makes them accessible. And uh, you know, th those themes uh, of love were you know, f framed in a way that was pleasingly exotic, but not too remote to be accessible. Uh, and then much of this poetry, and in particular half is his poetry, also has a, a great deal about wine drinking and <laughs> disregarding religious precepts and misbehaving and obeying the heart and not the head. And again, these things you know, have a universal appeal. So I think that um, you know, those at were attractive to different generations of poets for slightly different reasons. As I've suggested, for the Romantics, I think it was a way to kind of overthrow a sort of stale, what they saw as a stale, formalistic kind of poetical canon. If you get to the later 19th century, to, to Tennyson and, 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 and Emerson and, uh, and, and others, some of them, I mean, Tennyson actually made an effort to learn Persian, being, being a hardworking uh, person. Uh, they you know, they find slightly different things uh, interesting in it. They, they become, I, I think the esoteric elements uh, become uh, uh, more important al along with the erotic. Um, and then by the time you get to Omar Khayyam and being translated by Fitzgerald towards the end of the 19th century, the sort of late Victorian era, you've got a very different kind of, you know, cultural uh, era in, in, in English literature. And he's really looking at the carpe diem, celebrate the moment, you know. Again, by no means capturing all of the sophistication of the Persian original, but finding in it something that seemed intensely relevant to his time and to what he wanted to express himself as a poet. Does that resonate with your feelings for Hafez and the poetry of this period? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what you were saying about um, the um, presence of you know, wine and the mechane and the... the the tavern, I suppose you'd translate that as, or the place where you drink wine. These kind of aspects, I think, are really um, have a really interesting importance for the reception of the poetry in Iran, um, because I think you know Hafez is written seven, six, seven centuries after the Arab invasion, so Islam has been established in Iran. But he speaks to the the combination of Islamic and pre-Islamic culture being very important in Iran. Um, so it has, you know, elements of religiosity in it, but it also has it has elements which of, you know, how intoxication is very important, and so, and you know, still today, Iran balances these two um, aspects of their culture, um, which remain very important, and I think that's also partly why Hafez plays an interesting role in sort of um, strains of Persian nationalism, um, which is, you know, important even today. The idea that there is a pre-Islamic culture in Iran that is very important and very unique and the um, you know the sort of implicit assumption that Iranian culture is separate from Arab culture even though in, in reality they are now so intertwined you know in a complex ways but Hafez is kind of strategically uh, deployed by Iranians as a way of kind of um, showing that the the strength and the power of, of Iranian culture really. Well, one of the composers to be intoxicated by Hafez's poetry was Karol Szymanowski, and we're now going to hear one of his love songs of Hafez from Opus 24, the first song performed as the last song was by Joshua Owen Mills, tenor and Sholto Kainok at the piano. This is Wünsche. <laughs> Thank you. 
going to now uh, uh, take my prerogative as chair to actually speak a few words from my own discipline, which is about Russia, which is always an interesting voice in this question of imperialism and exoticism, because for Europeans, Russia is very often the exotic, but it had its own relationship with Hafez and his poetry. Um, one of the things that's very fascinating, um, and, and Ed, you also read Russian as an undergraduate, so you may have come across this then, is that um, unlike the empires of France and of Britain, the Russian Empire is land-based and it's next door. So you don't have to go off to British India, you don't have to go off to North Africa. You just carry on walking or in a carriage or eventually on a railway and you end up in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, in Astrakhan, in, uh, in any of the non-Russian parts of this vast multi-ethnic, multilingual, uh, multicultural, multi-religious empire. And so Hafez actually looks a little bit different in some ways because he's a neighbor rather than someone across the seas. And this, I suppose the presence of Hafez, his poetry, uh, Persian poetry, in amongst a number of other oriental languages and literatures makes him feel very different to Russians perhaps. And would, does that seem to... to, to, to yes, I, th I think it's a t that makes sense to me. I mean, if you say, I, I always feel that somehow the Caucasus is, is very close to the, the Russian, mm -hmm. the, the heart in Russian literature. I mean, obviously there are some, some great examples of that, more so than Central Asia for, for, for strange reasons. But th there's no doubt that you know, Russia encounters Persian in a very direct way. And, you know, again, you get that same thing of, uh, of Persian language and Persian studies and Persian literature going into, into Russian, uh, the Russian Academy first and then more broadly Russian culture with lots of people, I in the case of Russia, actually coming from, you know, the Caucasus or Central Asia and settling in Kazan or Petersburg or Moscow later uh, to teach and to study. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a unique uh, experience, but it, it does certainly bear comparison with what's happening in continental Europe or in England. Yes, and that two-way flow of Russians going to the Caucasus and then off and on into uh, Iran, um, famously Gribayedov, who gets murdered in, in Tehran, um, but then also local elites coming back to the capitals and, and sharing it. But in song, something very odd happens. You would have thought that Russian composers could have got Hafez in nice, accurate, idiomatic translations direct from uh, mm. Persian. But no, in fact, what happens is they take Georg Daumer's German versions, which are turned into Russian in 1859 by Afanasi Fiet. And Fiet thinks Daumer has translated accurately and idiomatically because he presumes Daumer speaks Persian. He doesn't. He's, he, these are imitations, Nachdichtungen. Um, and so they, they come rather strangely into Russian literature, despite the presence of Orientalists and translators and experts. Um, and right through the late 19th century and early 20th century, Russian song is full of Hafez settings, which are based on Afanasi Fiet's Russian versions of Georg Daumer's German approximations. So it's a strange story of distance and absence. Um, and I think we should now hear one. This is a setting from 1916 by Alexander Grechaninov, performed again by Joshua Owen Mills and Sholto Kainuk at the piano. <laughs> 
So we've heard settings of Hafez's poetry by a contemporary British composer, by a Polish composer, by a Russian composer. Um, and we've talked a little bit about Hafez and his reception in Europe, but I'd like to move forward to more recent history because one of the most striking things about it is how topical and contemporary the poetry is. So, so San, perhaps you could tell us uh, how Hafez still lives um, and, and what happened up to the revolution, indeed after the revolution. Yeah, so the, with the 20th century, um, in terms of maybe Iran's relationships with European powers, it's really kind of characterized by a kind of largely paternalistic relationship with first the UK and then, then the US, really. Um, and in terms of music in that period, we see a kind of gradual westernization, really, of Iranian classical music. Um, by around the 50s, 60s, um, the style of, ch of playing had changed and music was, uh, Iranian classical music was becoming more and more westernized. Um, and then in about the, the sort of 70s, so this was just before the revolution, um, the sort of late 70s, there's um, an interesting thing happened. So the, um, the Shiraz Arts Festival is established and it's a kind of pet project of the then sort of final shah of, of Iran's wife, Farah. And she set up this festival and it was very much a case of kind of East looking at West, looking at East sort of thing. She set up this festival very much with the idea of um, proving Iran to be an international country and showing this through art and music. And, you know, we have major figures of uh, classical music, people like Zanarkis, people like John Cage, who um, had works performed at the Shiraz Arts Festival. It was very much a kind of focus on um, international music. Um, it was also seen as potentially a kind of example of how uh, out of touch the regime was, you know, this incredibly expensive, extravagant festival that most ordinary Iranians could never afford to go to, you know, millions and millions of pounds was being spent on it. But what's interesting is that a lot of the events happened, um, it was in Shiraz, and a lot of events happened at Hafez's tomb. Um, and this is at least in part, I think, a recognition of, at this point, the kind of global nature of Hafez, almost as like a brand, as a, as a thing that Iranian, um, Iranian, it's certainly this um, Iranian regime was kind of using to sort of show we are international, you know, we are, um, it was a, a really a kind of attempt to say, yes, we have this ancient culture, but look how modern we are at the same time. So Hafez has this really interesting role of being, um, you know, performing both of these things at the same time, which I think is quite interesting. And the obvious question is, how do things change after the revolution? The things we talked about of wine and of pleasure and of carpe diem sit perhaps rather strangely with, mm. with what we might think of as, as, as uh, modern day Iran. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in terms of music, immediately after the revolution, there wasn't really any music at all uh, for a period. And then music gradually came back into society through military songs um, during the Iran-Iraq War. That was the only really permitted kind of music. Um, and then gradually, you know, music as we know it now uh, started to come back in. And poetry and poetry of people like Hafez was really central because words have a, um, a higher status um, in Islam and Islamic culture, whereas music is ambivalent. You know, reading and writing about music was always considered very high status, but listening to music was associated with intoxication. So when you have the words of someone like Hafez, who is still so highly regarded, it enables music to be kind of accepted. But yeah, there has been, um, there's definitely a kind of effort to reinterpret a lot of his works and the meaning. So the Meikhane, which is the place where you go to drink wine, is now interpreted as the mosque. And the intoxication is not intoxication with wine, it's intoxication with a love for God. So there's ways of reinterpreting it so that you don't lose this incredibly important national resource, but you can sort of slightly push aside the aspects of it which don't really fit in with the current regime. Mm. And, and Ed, um, we've, we've heard of classical uh, Persian literature music, but Hafez goes beyond classical. I mean, is that even a useful word to, to use? Because it has connotations of taste and style, and it's perhaps even a Western word in some ways. Yes, I mean, we, we tend to try and avoid it and say pre-modern rather mm -hmm. than classical because, you know, our, you know, it's always dangerous to apply terms that were coined in relation to the West mm -hmm. to Iranian or other non-Western cultures because th there's a danger that they'll, you know, be misleading rather than helpful. But, yeah, I mean, you know, these love songs ha have not only been important in making the music 
you know, legitimate in, in, in an environment which is perhaps, you know, tends to be hostile towards music and performance, particularly performance by women. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's also, these lyrics have formed, you know, a very large part of the pop lyric repertoire, mm -hmm. uh, not only of Iran, but, you know, also of the Caucasus, Central Asia, and I indeed, you know, S South Asia as well. Mm -hmm. So the ghazal, you know, is, is not something that is by any means unique to Iran. And it's not unique to Persian. It's in Urdu, and it's in uh, it's in many of the other literatures which were in a close relationship with Persian uh, in their formation and evolution. And pop songs, you know, to this day will often make use of classical, you know, or pre-modern uh, lyrics, uh, you know, in completely modern settings, mm -hmm. musical settings. And uh, Ed, you just raised that really interesting question of gender and performance, and I, I wonder how that plays out as well, um, because of love and singing and voices are, are there differences between the way male and female performers and audiences engage with this poetry and music and recitation mm. yeah well the, the situation currently in iran is that it's illegal for women to sing solo in public um which means and you know when we're talking about performances of iranian classical music the vast majority of the lyrical content is poetry like hafez or you know similar similar poets so you end up with a situation where female performers are prevented from the kind of discursive role, um, the most important role, the singer is the kind of most high status role in ensembles in public. Um, this has resulted in a few kind of creative responses to this. So in the late 80s, um, Hossein Alizadeh, who is a very famous tar and setar player and composer, invented uh, something called hamkhani, which is basically when you have two or three women or you know a woman and a man singing together in unison and that's permitted because the idea is that you can't detect the kind of material of the single female voice which is deemed intoxicating and dangerous or you also have this interesting kind of recent thing that's arisen where you have female only concerts and even female only whole festivals of music um, where men are not allowed to attend they are um, the doors are closed, you have to leave your phone at the door, there's no recording, and it's, it's quite fascinating, I've been to one myself, so you go into the room and everyone takes off their hijab and their mantles, and you sort of, it feels like a kind of family concert, everything becomes very relaxed. Um, and so these are ways in which female singers are able to still take part in the recitation of this poetry, but yet unfortunately in public settings it will still always be a man really leading that. Well, this year's Leader Festival should have seen the performance of uh, a new work in the UK premiere of a composition by Mahdis Goza Kashani. She can't actually be here this year, and it's very much hoped that that premiere will take place, in fact, in 2021. Instead, however, we can hear another work of hers, this time a setting of the poetry of Rumi. This is Heart Snatcher, performed by Soraya Mafi and Shilto Kainak. 
So welcome back, and we now move to our Q&A session. And thanks to those members of the audience who have had the time to get in touch, whether through Twitter or whether through email, to put their questions. And I'm going to try and synthesize some of those uh, in our discussion, but we still have some uh, time to take on those. One question which we didn't really answer in our, or didn't explore in detail in our, in our previous discussion was what sort of really contemporary responses are, perhaps musical but literary and, and cultural. I mean, Susan, you took us through Shiraz Music Festival and then the immediate effects of the revolution, but really what's going on these days? And are composers using him or are, how are people engaging with Hafez at a greater level? Yeah, I mean, he remains absolutely central to national identity. I think today is National Hafez Day in Iran, so I'm sure there's a number of events going on there. Um, yeah, I mean, on a, on a, I mean, I think in the context of the UK, poetry seems like a more elite art form, which is absolutely not the case in Iran. It is a totally mass art form. It is the national art form, you could potentially argue. You know, you, in, your, in your daily life, if you're in Iran, you will meet people who may be you know, e even illiterate people who can uh, quote lines and lines of Hafez to you um, because it's just so sort of central to national identity. Um, the Divan of Hafez is almost thought of as a kind of fortune, has, how it, you can tell your fortune through it. You, you have to sort of hold in your mind a question that you have and open the book and any page on the book will tell you the answer of what, you know, what you should do. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, even a, there's a TV, there's a game show on TV. It's a little bit like Iranian Deal or No Deal, but it's a poetry game show. And uh, contestants come on and they have to cite a quote a line of poetry and the, the last letter of the line they cite has to be the first letter of the line the next person cites. And they go on and on and on until they, you know, you run out and the winner, you know, wins a huge prize. So it's, you know, hugely important to national identity and composers are tapping into this. Um, uh, contemporary composers, so the, the system of Iranian music is, is really called the Radif, it's based on a particular system, and composers nowadays are exploring the limits of the Radif, you know, experimenting, pushing it in different directions, seeing how far they can take it. Sometimes that involves using classical poetry like Hafez, and sometimes it involves kind of taking that a step further and using contemporary poetry. And, you know, Faruga Farokhzad is a very famous female poet from the 20th century who is kind of ambivalently viewed by the regime because some, some of her poetry deals with topics that are kind of lay outside of what they see as acceptable, but also she's, you know, her poetry is so powerful and she's so popular that they have this kind of strange ambivalent relationship. And it, I think, you know, it's really drawing a single line from people like Hafez to the present day in the way that um, contemporary poetry is used in composition as well as people at Hafez. Uh, could, I, could I jump yes, in here? I mean, just to put you on the spot for a moment and ask you about your own uh, response to Hafez and how Hafez or indeed other, other poets feature in your own creative process. Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, from a personal point of view, so I, I grew up in the UK and growing up Iranian in the UK can sometimes be a bit tricky. You know, there have been times when the only thing people know about Iran are quite negative things. Um, and But Hafez is one of the few things that I feel like a lot of people know and people have immediate positive feelings about. And it, it was sort of things like Hafez, it was a way of making a kind of connection or sort of explaining a tiny bit about your culture which didn't lead down a huge conversation about politics and things that you don't really want to get into at all times. So yeah, it, it's it's a kind of it's it's a it's a matter of pride as well for Iranians to say this is an element of our culture and have people everywhere know about it, you know, which doesn't isn't always the case um, for for Iran, you know, aspects of Iranian culture. And um, yeah, I'm very interested in using Iranian poetry. I haven't used um, half as so far in my in my work, but. Um, it's really the kind of, like Hafez is kind of the lineage, I think, that, that so many Iranian poets draw from. So the poetry that I've used um, in my composition, that I've set, you know, I've, I've set the words of, is absolutely coming from this kind of Hafez as this sort of center point. And what does he mean to you, Ed? Um, can we turn this question back well, on you? Well, as you know, Philip, I'm a historian, really, not a, not, so, uh, but, when I decided which direction I wanted to go in in my specialism, I, I didn't choose poetry, although I, in, you know, my undergraduate degree course was, was poetry heavy. And I did that really because I felt I wanted to keep poetry for my personal enjoyment um, rather than for you know, academic study. 
So, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy Hafez and other Persian poetry very much uh, and appreciate it. And I, I, I think I'm able to do that more because I don't spend my time studying it and writing academic articles about it. So I've, I've kind of wanted to keep it in my personal space in a way rather than have it in my professional space. Well, we don't trust us any more on, on that private <laughs> relationship. Uh, we've got a question that's come in from uh, Natasha who says, Hafez has really dominated our discussion and the, the, the day is devoted to him. Um, and there's clearly a, a great passion for him on the part of his readers. Um, but uh, he overshadows perhaps other writers and other voices. And so this is a call for other poets that uh, uh, people might explore and so re recommendations for good translations, accessible versions. So if you have any thoughts to share. I can recommend a couple of contemporary, uh, well, 20th century poets. As I said, Farouk Farokhzad. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, if you Google, you'll work out the spelling. If I'm you sure do. the Lida Festival team are doing that already. We can and write it will that be, down. We'll, we'll put some, some information out there. Um, yeah. She's a fantastic poet. Um, very sadly, she was killed very young uh, in a car crash. I think she was in her 30s. And her poetry is, is really, really beautiful. There's also uh, a poet called Ahmad Shamlu. He died, in, I think, around the year 2000. Um, and his poetry is very beautiful. Um, and... Yeah, there, there's a, actually the, I, a piece of mine that I wrote um, where I took the title from a title of one of his poems, and it's called I Am the Spring, You Are the Earth. And it's a very, very beautiful poem that he writes to his wife, um, describing his love for her by likening the, the two of them to kind of various um, uh, environmental or natural things. And it's, yeah, his, his work is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Ed, any thoughts for our yeah. eager... Yeah, I mean, we eager. haven't actually said which of the translations of Hafez that people should read, or the, or the versions of Hafez. And uh, I think there are two that I particularly like. They're not necessarily the most accurate, but I think they both work very well as English poetry. One is Gertrude Bell's um, uh, versions, and then Elizabeth Bridges also wrote some, some uh, you know, half is inspired uh, poems. And I, th I think those two would be very good places for people to go to get, a, to get some sense of half is. There's quite a number of good translations now of pre-modern Persian poets. Uh, there's one translator in particular I'd mentioned because he's been very prolific and very, very good, and that's Dick Davis, and a number of Persian poets have been translated by him in Penguin Classics and elsewhere, Attar, um, Ferdowsi. So I, th I don't think you'll go far wrong with a, a translation uh, by, uh, by Dick Davis. But yeah, it, it's a very fair point that Natasha makes. We've, we haven't talked about a lot of very good Persian poets, yeah. <laughs> Saadi, uh, Rumi, we've scarcely mentioned. Um, uh, the most popular uh, contemporary translation of Rumi is, of course, Coleman Barks, and you know that's probably the most popular English version of any Persian poet since Fitzgerald's Omar Khayyam. But I, you know, it, it's obviously great that Persian poetry becomes so well known to a wide audience. But it's it's quite far removed, in my view, from the meaning and the spirit of the original. Uh, and we now have a new translation of Rumi by, by Lewis, there's several good new translations, another by Williams. Uh, so there, there's a number of other translations of Rumi that I would encourage people to look at. Excellent. And we should, of course, mention that the um, Sally Beamish uh, mm. songs that we heard earlier on uh, mm. have translations by Jilla Peacock, and so there's another mm. uh, creative voice in, 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 in the dialogue there. Um, I had a question. Uh, I'm really fascinated by the canonicity, the ubiquity, and the, the, the unfeigned love that people have. But it, why does this happen? Because when poets are so institutionalized, they're taught in school, they're everywhere in poetry, you go to Shiraz and there's the tomb, it can generate a kind of ab reaction and an animosity, not so much against the poet, but against the canonization and the culture of, of worship and deification. So, um, has there been a, a, a sort of critical reaction to Hafez's poetry? Have there been voices who've, who've wanted to downplay the significance? Or, or is it a universal, ubiquitous uh, outpouring of love on the part of uh, readers and audiences and listeners? Yeah, I think, I mean, Iranian culture doesn't lend itself so much to ridiculing, you know, the great figures of your past. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no Iranian equivalent of 1066 and all that mocking, you know, the <laughs> entire history of... Uh, of the country, perhaps it's overdue for there to be such a thing. But um, you know, I, I think, uh, as Susan said, uh, 
Still today, most Iranians see poetry as being the, the archetypal art form and the, the archetypal Persian art form. It's the thing that they take most pride in. And the poetry is great poetry. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, there's a reason why it has traveled so well, not only over space, but over time. Uh, and I think that anyone who has a kind of, you know, poetic sensibility, even if they're reading, you know, a translation that isn't very um, exact and isn't necessarily even very successful poetry in the, in the target language, it still conveys something of the, the, the beauty of the original and, and, and there's something to get hold of there. Yeah, absolutely. I think in the um, contemporary context, I think maybe one of the reasons that it sort of stayed so central and so important, um, well, first of all, I think it's absolutely, it's seeped into the language. I mean, if you spend any time in Iran today, people speak in a poetic way. People speak sometimes in a kind of vague and esoteric way, and it has, it has sort of seeped into the language and the culture in, in a very direct way. I also think, you know, we sort of touched on this before, I think the complexity and the kind of multi-layered aspects of Hafez means that you can read into it different things and it can be kind of strategically drawn on uh, in different ways. So it can, it can be drawn on, you know, depending on the interpretation of what, of, of what he's talking about, it can be drawn on um, as a kind of, um, uh, as, as a way of talking about kind of is Islamic culture and Islamic nationalism, things like that, or it can be drawn on to sort of almost um, sidestep Islam and talk more about Persian culture and, and pre-Islamic culture. And it sort of manages all these different things at the same time. So you might have a kind of um, actor in the Iranian government right now using Hafez as a, as a way of showing kind of you know, the power of Iranian culture and its entanglement with Islam. And then you might have someone who has a kind of political, a very different political agenda also drawing on Hafez to make very, very different points. And I think that's because of the, the complexity and the richness of the poetry that it allows you to do both of these kinds of things. Uh, and is there therefore a kind of government approach to him? You talked about the pre-revolutionary period and Hafez as a brand, of East meets West meets East kind of thing. Is, is, there, is this just a popular poet amongst readers? It's, it's ubiquitous in the culture, it's wound into the language, or, or are they aware of the ability to use him as a, a figure for, for contemporary uh, Iranian culture? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, they're very aware of it and aware of the power, and Hafez's tomb is a really brilliant example of that. It's a very, very beautiful um, place, and it's, you know, it's a tourist attraction, um, uh, a, a kind of national tourist attraction, but also one of international interest, and that is absolutely recognised um, by um, the, the kind of cultural departments in the Iranian government, and, and, and they recognise Hafez's global reach as well as other poets, and they, they see that, you know... Um, a different poet here, but uh, there's a quote from Saadi on the, um, the, the front door of the UN, um, which is a kind of real source of pride for a country which has, for the past 40 years, been sort of kept out of the international community to have one of their national poets have the kind of quote on the, on the UN, which is all about, um, you know, we, we are humans, we all are of one body, and anybody who does damage to any part of that does not have a right to be called a human. And to have that connection to the global political community at a time when you know, Iran has really been kept out of that is hugely important, and, and the government recognizes the value of that. Yeah, that sounds well, very encouraging and very positive. Um, I think we've come towards the end of our discussions. Uh, all that remains for me to do is to suggest that you open a glass of wine or something and uh, <laughs> sit down on meditate on the poetry get ready for some more lovely songs not just this evening but throughout the rest of the, the festival but really i should uh, thank susan and ed for sharing their expertise and their enthusiasm and their passion and for guiding us uh, towards some new reading and new discoveries thank you so much thank you thank Philip. you